rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then Joseph goes on to tell him about another dream. He said, I had another dream. In verse 9. And this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to him. By the time he gave his second dream, the, the hostility was so evident that even his father, Jacob, felt that it was necessary to rebuke Joseph. Now, if you have studied the life of Joseph, you know that these dreams were prophetic in nature. The dreams came from God and they showed what God planned to do in Joseph's life. But the fact that Joseph thought his brothers would be excited about these dreams, you know, shows just how sheltered and naive Joseph really was. When something great happens in your life, you know, you go start advertising to the wrong people, that's going to end up in more heartache and trouble than you had envisioned. So you got to know who to go. You know, you got to be naive about all the things that, that are happening and you're just going sharing everything out. The rest of the story that we know from the Bible is that is a familiar one. The older brothers were tending their father's flock some distance away from home. And Jacob had not heard from them. You know, he hadn't heard anything from them. So Jacob sent Joseph to see about them. And of course, Joseph, where, you know, he came up with his fancy suit and, 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 his, and his coat of many colors uh, for the trip. I, I wonder how you would have felt if you were one of Joseph's brothers and saw him wear that coat. And when they saw him coming, that, that coat of many colors well, was like a red flag waving in their faces. They're like, man, so they plot to, you know, they started plotting against Joseph. Most of them wanted to kill him. But Reuben, the oldest brother, suggested that instead of killing him, that they throw him into a deep well, a cistern, and just leave him there to die. That they wouldn't be guilty of shedding his blood. The Bible says, this is the reason why Reuben did this. The Bible says in Genesis 37, 22, Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father later on. So he didn't want to kill Joseph. But the rest of them thought that was a good idea. So when Joseph got to their camp, they seized him, stripped him off his coat, and threw him into the well, the cistern. But then, as they were eating, they saw a slave caravan just come by, passing by on its way to Egypt. But Judah, one of the brothers, another brother, you know, he had a bright idea. Let's sell him to these people. We'll save ourselves from the guilt of murder, and we'll even we'll make a little money on the side. The Bible says in Genesis 30, 37, 28, it says, he pulled Joseph up out of the system and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. They made some money. All I'm saying is how quickly things can go wrong. You know, you're thinking, oh man, I'm doing so well. Things are getting great. I'm just going to ride this wave. And then, bam, it can go wrong. Things can go wrong really quickly. One moment, Joseph was the pampered son of a prosperous farmer in Persia with bright hopes uh, and, and a happy future. He even had dreams of how great things were going to be for him. The next moment, he was a slave. They took Joseph into Egypt as a slave. See, one reason we remember Joseph is the fact that his story is so relevant to us today. We have all experienced things going wrong. Maybe you're a student and in school or at work or, or even in, in marriage or in our health. Things can go wrong like that or even in our hopes. Joseph lost his fancy coat. He lost his pampered position and even his freedom. So when things go wrong in your life, I want you to, you know, the reason why I'm mentioning it, is I want you to consider that Joseph as a good example of how, what to do in life when things go wrong, when things go terrible. One thing we learn from Joseph is 
that when things go wrong, we may or may not be responsible. Now, sometimes we are responsible for what happens. Sometimes we aren't. In one way, Joseph was, and in another way, he wasn't. The cause of his trouble was the hatred of his brothers. That hatred was fanned by two flames. One was his lack of being sensitive to the feelings of the older brothers. If you have siblings, you need to be careful. The other was the unmistakable and unconcealed favoritism of his father towards him. Now, and you can make out a good case for, uh, uh, for the fact that, that the first trouble was caused by the second. You see, if Jacob had shown more sense in dealing equally with all his children as every father should. You know, you can't just go around having a favorite and causing all kinds of troubles and heartaches down the road. Joseph would never have supposed that he would, if he was treated equally, if all the children were treated equally, Joseph would never have uh, supposed that he was anything more than a little brother of the big boys. Things would have been okay. What am I saying? I'm saying that the Bible story suggests that when things go wrong, we may or may not be responsible. Now sometimes we are. Whenever our difficulty uh, arises from a condition which is the consequence of our own choices, well we are responsible for that. For example, a girl falls in love. She idealizes her sweetheart. She ignores or downplays his faults. Uh, I mean, we all say uh, love is blind. But it's often a self-induced blindness, that's what I'm saying, in which she convinces herself that he will change after they get married. Well, <laughs> what are the chances of that? He proposes and she supposes. <laughs> that life with him will be blissful. And once they're married, he's going to make, you know, things going to be great. Like this bride was walking down the altar. She was really nervous. And so, you know, they tell her to focus on just a few things. So she says, okay, all I got to do is walk down the aisle. That's what I'm going to remember. All I got to do is remember I got to go to the altar. So I'll go there, I'll remember the eye, and I'll go to the altar. And then they're going to sing a song, a hymn, right? And then she said, I'm going to remember that they're going to sing a song. That's all I'm going to focus. She walks up, walks up, walks up, and you know, she's muttering under her breath. She's saying, I'll alter him. I'll alter him. <laughs> you won't alter him at all. <laughs> he's, he's just going to be just that way. You know, he's not about to change. And things go wrong, you know. Gradually, or sometimes suddenly, the romance fades. And she finds that life is not at all like what she thought it would be. He's not going to change. And things go wrong. But say what you will, in a very real sense, she is responsible. It was she and no one else who said yes. You see, that's why God gives guidelines about friendship and marriage. He wants to help us make the right choices. And when we ignore them, you know, we do that to our own dismay. But then in life there are times when we're not responsible for what happened. We work hard and save for our old age. And inflation cuts our savings in half. We study hard earn a degree, get a good job, you don't think, oh, I'm a graduate, I went to college, I did all that, and I got a good job. Promotions come, and the future looks bright, but then the economy changes, and our job is gone, and we find ourselves having to start all over again. The Bible says in Jeremiah 31, 19, the fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Maybe you heard this, uh, you know, this interesting statement. He met misfortune like a man, he blamed it on his wife. You see, 
human tendency is to evade responsibility. But it's true that sometimes when things go wrong, we're not responsible. So next time you see, when things go wrong, we may or may not be responsible for the cause, but we are responsible for the result. And the result often depends upon how we meet the situation. I wish we knew what went on in Joseph's mind as he was being taken as a slave down to Egypt. One, he could have reacted bitterly toward God. You know, when something goes wrong, uh, he could have said, so this is the way you run things. What have I done to deserve this? I was trying to do what my father told me to do. I was out looking for my brothers and report back home. That's what I was doing. I was doing my duty. And this is the result. God, you know, I, I'm through with you. Joseph could have said that. He said, I've always tried uh, to, to follow your rules and do what's right. But look at what it got me. You know, from now on, I'm going to do what I want. You see, he could have said all that. You see, when things go wrong, many people take that sort of an attitude in life. They blame God and they quit. They, they go their own way. And God no longer has any place in their lives. But there are others who say, I may not be responsible when things go wrong, but I am responsible for what I do about it. So they meet the situation, not with bitterness or cowardice, but with courage and determination. That's what Joseph did. And even as a slave, he soon received honors and responsibilities of life. Then, when things were, this is the way things got to be, that there was part of his wife. She tried to entice Joseph. She tried to entice Joseph to sin. But what did Joseph do? He steadfastly refused to defile himself and sin against God. Again, things went wrong. Because Joseph did the right thing. He was lied about by his temptress, arrested and imprisoned. Well, doing what was right the first time, he had been sold into slavery. And now, He's trying to do the right thing again. He's done the right thing. He's been put in prison. Now, why should he remain faithful to God? He's like, I'm doing the right thing here. I'm getting in trouble. I'm doing the right thing again. And things are all messed up. I mean, you said, oh, God is good and all that. And look where it got me. You know, what's going on here? Huh? Why should he remain faithful to God? Can you maybe hear him talking to himself in prison, you know? But the thing is, this is what probably Joseph said to himself. I may or may not be responsible for what has happened. But I am responsible for what I do about it. He refused to become bitter and blame God. We never hear anything in Joseph's uh, sayings uh, that the Bible notes about him blaming God. Instead, he met his trials with courage and determination to keep doing what was right. Amen? Yes. So finally, when the time came, he was ready to fulfill the role in history that God had prepared for him. There's a third thing that we can learn from Joseph. First, when things go wrong, we may or may not be responsible. Second, we are responsible for what we do about it. Third, with God's help, the result can be better than we ever dreamed possible. For example, Joseph's predicament turned into a tremendous personal blessing for him. He ultimately became the Prime Minister of Egypt. And his rise to power was directly related to his so-called bad luck in life. Man, that's got to be bad luck. He did the right thing, he was sold as a slave. He did the right thing, he was put in prison. It's getting to be really bad here. But all those things, the so-called bad luck, you know, directly uh, was contributing towards his rise in power. Look, had he never been sold into slavery, he would have never met Potiphar. Had he never met Potiphar, he would have never been put in prison. Had he never been put in prison, he would have never met Potiphar's or, or Pharaoh's baker in the prison. Had he never met the Pharaoh's baker, 
Here they would have never been asked to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. Had he never interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, he would never have been made prime minister of Egypt. What am I saying? I'm saying, you see, sometimes success is nothing but failure turned inside out. And no one needs to be defeated because out of every situation, he or she can emerge a better person if he or she has the will to do it. You see, God brings you to that situation. You, you know, don't blame God. You, you have to say, look, God can turn this thing around. Someone said, if, if life gives you lemon, then make lemonade. 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 Yeah, in the same way, an oyster takes a grain of sand, which irritates it and tries to get rid of it. When it, when it cannot, it takes that grain of sand and makes a pearl out of it. Thomas Edison, when he was a boy, received a, a, a blow to his ear, which made him deaf. But he said that his deafness kept out the distractions and helped him concentrate in life. And that ability to concentrate was largely responsible for his success in many of the experiments. You know, if he had just not been concentrating, we wouldn't have all the stuff that we have today. In one of George McDonald's book, he tells of a woman who experienced sudden sorrow. Sudden sorrow, and she says, I wish I'd, I'd never been made. She complains bitterly, you know, this is terrible what's going on in my life. I wish I'd never been made. To which her friend quietly replies, my dear, you're not made yet. You're only being made. And this is part of the maker's process. You see, what happens to us is never the most important thing. The most important thing is how you react. Because every one of us has a unique situation that you're going to go through in life. How you respond to that situation makes all the difference. Joseph teaches us that even the worst difficulties can produce some amazing, great results in life. Amen? Amen. But the story doesn't end with Joseph becoming prime minister. Because, you see, he was elevated to that high position. Because of the fact that he was elevated to that high position, he was able to save not only the people of Egypt, but also his own brothers and their families and his elderly father too. The famine in Palestine drove his family to Egypt in search of food. And Joseph, through his influence, provided homes and land for them in Egypt. I and mean, he was there helping these people out. You see, when things go wrong, we often have a chance to help not only ourselves, you know, most of us are consumed with ourselves, but not only ourselves, but to render a service to others too. A man was in an automobile accident and his eyes were injured. The surgeon told him that he could save only one eye. And the other eye would have to be removed and a glass eye has to be inserted. It was a terrible moment for him. But finally he smiled and said, all right, if you have to put, a, put in a glass eye for me, you know, please put a click in it. <laughs> you see, do you know people like that? You see, what life did to them and what they have done with life. There are people like that. People who take a, a, a lemon that they've been given and made a flourishing lemonade business venture out of it. Now lastly, when things go wrong, you have to remember whatever else you learned today or, or looked in the Bible, whatever else you took out of today. You came to church, remember this. When things go wrong, God is always there to help us. When something goes wrong, we may or may not be responsible for the cause. You don't know what happened. You know, I did the right thing. Whatever it happened, maybe you were responsible. Let's say, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and say, you're not responsible. We may or may not be responsible for the cause. But we're definitely responsible for the result. You know, anything that happens, you can say, well, you know, that thing that didn't, didn't need to happen. This didn't need to happen. And meeting the situation with determination and courage, you know, when you do that, the result can be good. But most importantly, our courage and our determination can feed on the assurance 
that we have as Christians that God is our friend and is always there to help us. No matter what is going on in your life. Remember that. That God is our friend. He called He, he called us. Jesus said, I no longer call you slave, but I'm calling you my friend. And because he's your friend, remember, you can't take that out of the equation. That God is your friend, and he's always there to help us. No matter who it was that came to Jesus, no matter the situation, he always turned around and helped. You see, do you remember the dramatic scene in the last chapter of Genesis? Joseph had brought his family to live in Egypt. The brothers who sold him into slavery were now completely in his power. He is the prime minister. If, they, if he said, chop their heads off, they would chop their heads off. Finally, their father Jacob dies. And after his death, the brothers are very afraid. They're scared for their life because they sold them to slavery. They made their life, his life difficult. Fearing the worst, they throw themselves down before Joseph and beg his forgiveness. They say, please, you know, don't do some crazy stuff, please. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 15 verse 20, it says, this is Joseph's answer. He says, don't be afraid. And I include the word silly. Don't be afraid. Silly. Don't be afraid. And then he says, you intended to harm me. But God intended for good. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So instead of throwing a pity party on the bad things that's happened, it's going to say, oh me, oh how am I going to go through this, oh what's happening, I did the right thing, I should not have gone through, I don't deserve this, all kinds of things that you can say. You know, God can turn that thing around for good. Right. Yes. What an example Joseph sets for us today. To believe when things go wrong, that it's not God's doing, but man's misdoing. To believe when things go wrong, that there is a loving God who really desires the very best for us. You have to believe that in your heart of hearts. Mm, yes. As a foundation of your faith. To believe when things go wrong. And despite what others do. That God can bring good out of the evil that's been done. No matter what somebody has done. Or how they're treating you. What they're going to do. All of this stuff. It doesn't matter. You have to believe that God can bring good out of the evil that's been done to you. And to believe when things go wrong. Amen. And it will. Amen. To believe that God still loves us. And has a purpose oh, thank you. that He wants to accomplish in our lives. Amen. Yeah, amen. If you can receive that, say amen by faith. Hallelujah. Would you please stand at that <laughs> Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come before you. We thank you for this day, for each and every one of you. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you will manifest yourself mightily to each and every one. Let them know what an amazing God you are, what a privilege it is to serve you with gladness and heart. Thank you for being our great and amazing shepherd, for our for being our great high priest. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence <coughs> that convicts us of sin and leads and paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Yes, Lord. That shows us by promptings in our heart of hearts saying that this yes. is the way to go yes. and that yes. is not the way to go. Thank you, Jesus, for telling us that in this world you'll have tribulation, but take cause for I have overcome this world. Yes, Lord. If you're here in and you have burdens, whatever burdens you came to church with this morning, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you will not take those burdens with you, but lay them at the foot of the cross. Don't take them with you. Because Jesus said, come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy, and my burden yes. is light. To him be the glory on him. Prayer. Jesus is real. Jesus is alive and Jesus is here today. If you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, God made a day called today. Today is the day of salvation. All you have to do is open your heart to Him, ask Him to come into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. That's of the most prime 
thing, the most important Thank thing you can do in your entire life. Ask Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. Repent of your sins. Tell him that you believe that what he did on the cross was for you. Ask him for the gift of eternal life and God will honor every single sincere request raised to you. Whatever it is that God is putting on your heart, whatever commitment that you need to make, don't harden your heart like Pharaoh or anybody, but just yield to that Holy Spirit telling you what to do. To him be the glory, honor, and praise. Thank you, Jesus. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom Amen. come, that will be done Thank on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Not bring us to the test, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Keep standing, we'll sing our